Hey everybody, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pokolsky. Living your greatest life in a body you love means living in a body that supports whatever adventure you want to live. And life should be that, right? Life shouldn't be um, feeling trapped in a body that doesn't do what you want it to do. It should be this adventurous life where your body is like a sports car, well-oiled machine, able to do what you want, when you want. And as we age, oftentimes with the culture we've created, you know, we have blessings and curses, don't we? We have the blessing of convenience, um, but it's also the curse of convenience. And sometimes our body starts to become a little bit restricted from all the sitting and all the conveniences of modern day life. Whereas normally we would have been moving very actively, very ancestrally. Uh, a lot of our mobilities start to fade away. And I've you know, for a long time, been a huge advocate of mobility training, but there's never really been anyone out there who does an exceptional job of uh, explaining what it means. Because as people say, stretching is good, stretching is bad. Some people say foam rollers, some people say not foam rollers, some people say lacrosse ball or whatever, right? All these different modalities. And there's, there's seldom been someone yet who has a really, really good grasp. There are some people, you know, I can name a couple of guests in the past who have exceptional grasps. Today's guest is the world authority on mobility. And uh, I love, love, love this conversation. Like Kelly Sturette joins me today to just impart wisdom on us from years and years and years of understanding his craft. And he honestly surprised me with his depth of knowledge and uh, his ability to articulate is exceptional. He's obviously a world-class teacher for a reason. He travels the world teaching everyone uh, from pro athletes to Olympic athletes to average people simply how to move their body and understand what fits for them. There's no standard protocol, which I really like. And uh, he does an exceptional job of explaining a lot of uh, simple concepts and some complex ones um, that will allow you to understand how to ultimately use mobility to apply it to what you're trying to do, right? Just mobility for the sake of mobility isn't what he's about. He's like, hey, let's let's make this contextual. And uh, without more rambling from me, I know you're gonna enjoy this, this podcast with Kelly Sturette. Today's podcast is brought to you by Real Mushrooms. I'm a massive advocate of mushrooms, both the fun ones and the unfun ones, um, but uh, it is uh, exceptional for my brain to take lion's mane every day. And I, I kind of mega dose lion's mane. I take probably on the order of 10 to 15 grams a day. And it's all coming from real mushrooms. And the, re the benefit of real mushrooms is we're giving you 100% organic fruiting body, right? So one of the, the things that you guys may have heard me talk about in the past is a lot of these mushrooms out there are actually mycelia. They're mycelated grain. So a lot of the weight that you're paying for is actually the grain. So you're saying, yeah, I'm buying 300 grams of mushroom and maybe, I'm not gonna say a percentage, but some significant percentage of that is actually the mycelium grain that it's growing in. So you're not getting these active ingredients. So the mycelium can be useful, um, but it's, the grain itself is adding to the weight. So it's just ultimately decreasing the costs and not giving as an efficacious uh, product. So if you are using mushrooms already, switch to real mushrooms uh, for sure. If you're not using, using mushrooms, my top three that I think everyone should be using Lion's mane every day, uh, one to two times a day. I've actually been using it before bed lately to experiment with that uh, as well. So, and I use uh, reishi mushroom every day. And I use about three to four grams before bed. And that in incredibly helps my sleep, deep sleep and REM sleep, uh, both. I just feel so much more rejuvenated and relaxed in the morning. Uh, another one I'm, I've been experimenting with lately is cordyceps. And I think cordyceps is interesting because uh, it's been shown to improve performance. So um, I like that. I like the idea of improving my cardiovascular health. I like the idea of improving my VO2 max, both things that are correlated with uh, cordyceps. So um, I'm a massive, massive fan of realmushrooms.com. And you can head over there and use the code Ben to get 30% off. If you head to realmushrooms.com slash Ben, you can get the direct link to all this and a bunch more information differentiating. If you're really curious to understand the difference between fruiting bodies and the mycelium, there's a great uh, description article there on that page for you. So uh, I hope you enjoy your real mushrooms. I hope you enjoy this podcast with Kelly Sturette. And I'm super glad you're here. So thank you for being here. Massively grateful for you. I've had a lot of requests to do more one-off uh, one podcasts myself, solo podcasts. So those are going to be coming at you soon. Uh, and if there's any particular topic you want me to talk about, reach out to me on Instagram, reach out to me on uh, iTunes. You can leave a review. Let me know what you want me to talk about because I can talk for days, as you guys know. And I, I love interviewing people, but I do also love my uh, one-off podcasts. So enjoy the show with Kelly Sturette, and don't forget to head over to Real Mushrooms. Mr. Kelly Sturette, it's an honor and a privilege, my friend. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Very, very psyched to be here. Thank you very much, man. 
Yeah, man. Like I said, I've been following you for a long time and uh, own the, a copy of the Supple Leopard from, gosh, what feels like 10 years ago now, <laughs> and applied so many things, even as a professional bodybuilder, right? As a guy who was aspiring to be really big, um, I still saw the value and utility in keeping up with my mobility. And I think a lot of people overlook that and they get so myopically focused on their outcome. <clears throat> they don't consider all of the auxiliary work that can go into ultimately allowing you to maintain strength, stability, mobility as you progress into your highest level of performance. And as we briefly just spoke about before starting, there's this beautiful opportunity that exists in your space because you fit into everyone's life, right? Everyone needs some semblance of mobility and stability. And um, I'd love to have you start dissecting your thought process around helping people to mobilize joints because we have so many different um, modalities that exist, right? You know, there's massage, there's MAT, there's ART, there's lacrosse balls, there's you know, foam rollers, there's all of the stuff. And I'd love to have you just, if you have, you know, a statement or a belief or, you know, kind of a, a hypothesis as to how you would summarize how you approach um, mobility and stability. Well, uh, first of all, I'll say that, you know, you know we'll t dissect the sort of bodybuilding aesthetics, mass building component to it, because it's easy to have partial rep ranges. It's easy to sort of, sometimes if you try to port in full normative range of motion, full physiologic range of motion, you, you see is you can still do a ton of training with these incomplete ranges or, or compensated ranges, and you yeah. can get huge and reinforce sort of patterns that don't transfer. And I think, you know, if we look at bodybuilding as a, as a wholesome, kind of piece no one's better at putting a mass on people no one's better at body composition no one's better at leaning people out um and then also all the accessory work for having just rock solid bomber tendons and ligaments i mean that's i mean you know there we just need to be able to go in and say what's my goal as an athlete or what's my goal is through my body and then let's just start to aggregate best practices you know one of the things that happens is you can get away with having really, really restricted ranges. And I'm talking about baseline normative ranges, yep. which is like, can you put your arms over your head? Do you have full extension? Do you have a full internal rotation? And one of the things that I don't think people appreciate is that when you are under heavy load and trying to build actual mass, which is a real thing, you will become stiff. And that stiffness is not a it's not a, a, a feature or it's not a bug. It's a feature. Like you're just going to get stiff. Your tissues are going to, you know, you're going to have to keep an eye on this. And what will end up happening is pretty soon you're that guy who can barely feed the chicken sandwiches to his face or you can't put your arms over your head. And if you're chasing aesthetics, that's great. I don't really care what the goal is, but I ultimately want to make sure that when we, if we have to tackle a knee problem or tackle a hip problem, or you're going to translate that to something else. You're going to say that, hey, the goal of this is to become more athletic or to have better function in the world. Then we need to make sure we have a set of tools that allows you to restore your position. Instead of waiting until you have so much pain, and then I'm like, hey, by the way, you can't straighten your elbow and you have no internal rotation in your shoulder. It would have been easier if we just you know, started this initiation, this conversation early on. So, you know, one of the things that I think people, it's easy to forget is that I'm a coach and that all I really obsess about is biomotor output, which is the shorthand for, can you move, can you move big weights? Can you run fast? Can you ride your bike forever and win world championships? Those are the things that I'm really sort of obsessed with. And then the tools of mobilization, right? Or what I call position transfer exercises. So the only reason we're doing these mobilizations Yes, we can trigger some down regulation so that you can sleep, fall asleep at night, right? We can um, help you to manage and self-soothe pain, desensitize painful areas. Yes, all those are great. But the real goal is to establish some bookmarks around your function, around, hey, your shoulder can't do what you think it's supposed to do. And then when you bench, that's the problem or it's contributing to the problem. You know, and one of the, the issues for us is that we can get away with murder for a long time. I don't think people appreciate how durable humans are and our tolerance to just our genetic gift. And especially when you start working with mutants, you're like, man, this person just, you know, has adamantium bones and, you know, exoskeleton of, of titanium. And you can get away with a lot until you can't. And then what ends up happening is that there's a real dissociation because you're like, well, I did this forever. Why do I suddenly, why can't I do this? Or why can't I, you know, manage my pain? And then we're having to kind of dig through the layers. And what really ends up happening then is we play this shotgun approach. Well, throw everything at me to get me out of this pain so I can go back to do the thing I want to do. 
And what gets confusing for people, I think, in terms of bodybuilding or physique training is that we don't necessarily have clear landmarks of good functionality because it's hard to see what full range of motion looks like on a cable crossover. It's hard to see what the rotational concepts are if you're on a hammersmith, you know, pressing machine that does all the stabilization for you. So, you know, one of the things that we're always looking at is, look, if you, you know, when we define mobility and we really, I'm, I wanted to say, I'm sorry, it's my fault that that word is ever trended in the first place, is that I'm saying, look, you've got to have the range of motion tissue extensibility to achieve these positions. And then secondarily, you need to have the movement control to be able to express that. Like there's, so there's technique, right? Which is software. And then we've got hardware, which is your, your tissues and joints. And, you know, one of the things that we try to do is take the systems approach to restoring people's position. Cause ultimately that's what I'm, what I'm doing. And if someone shows up with pain, right? Well, one of the things I can do is improve your position, which will change how your brain is thinking about that threat state right? I can restore your sort of mechanical efficiency and economy there, which again, will change your brain, how you're thinking about the threat state, right? Your, your pain is information of it's kind of a request for change from your body. And it, and I want everyone to appreciate here that pain does not mean tissue damage at all. And that pain is, should be categorized just like loss of force production. Like, Hey, I had a huge session yesterday. I wasn't able to reduce that session cost. I'm trashed today on my output, my, my work volume, whatever it is, we should just view pain as one of those metrics. And then suddenly, you know, what we realize is, well, if we can rehydrate or reperfuse or decongest an area, then we might be able to, again, get you out of pain so you can restore it. But we still haven't even talked about your range of motion yet. And again, I think the key here is I'm like, well, I have clear ends at range of motion. So it's not just let's stretch forever and waste everyone's time. It's like, why can't you do this? And how much of this do you need to be able to do for your chosen sport? Because there will be some movement compromises, but we should always be chasing normative function. There's no reason why you can't have be moving towards more complete ranges. And what that does is actually creates better stability, better joint centration, better force production, right? You have better mechanical advantage. And what we're really seeing is you have more choice, especially when you want to get out of the gym and apply that to actual sports and training. So, you know, again, the way to look at this is mobilizations, position transfer exercises, accessory work, corrective exercise, skill transfer exercise, right? And in there, I don't use a lot of corrective exercise. My accessory work is my strength, is my conditioning couplets and triplets that I do just so I can keep myself conditioned. But I feel like in the classic language of strength and conditioning, like functional, more functional bodybuilding style training, we can progress and regress anyone. Like we're going to squat today, no matter what, you just may be squatting high to a box with your torso bent over, but we're squatting, right? Oh, you have a old, you know, herniation. Well, great. We're going to do this kind of squat a little bit more. Oh, you have a knee problem. We're going to have the shin a little bit more vertical on this squat. There's ways that we can progress and regress this. And then ultimately, you know, we just believe in slowing down or pausing and that's how we will program. So everyone already speaks the language I've taught on every continent, except for Antarctica. Everyone knows what a push up is. Everyone knows what a bench press is. So why do I have to have a correlate language of movement when that movement thing is the thing that everyone can agree on? And then we have this universal language. So underneath that, again, we have normative ranges of what you should be able to do as a tissue system joints, fascia, muscles, et cetera. And the only question is what aspect of that system is limiting you to be able to achieve that position? So there's kind of two levels to this question. The first one being, you know, you said briefly in there that most people don't ever start their mobility work until they get to the point where they're broken. So let's, let's reverse from there and go, okay, what would be some of the, the cues or preemptive reasons why people would start with mobility stuff? You and I know like, hey, you should just do it for general maintenance. But is there something you're looking for? Like, are you looking for, you know, movement imbalances? Are you looking for decreased motor output, decreased uh, tissue quality? Like, what are the what are the kind of uh, preemptive um, expressions of hey, we're going toward lack of mobility? Or what should what what is a, an average like maintenance program look like yeah. before someone gets injured? The question. What's interesting is we hear that as people are always like, give me the top three, you know, and I'm like, well, get, show me the. What you're really, what you're really asking is, what's not important in your body, yeah. right? What's not important to your body now? So ultimately, what we're doing, trying to do a better job, is conjoining people's soft tissue work, range of motion practice, with the training that they're doing. So, 
you know, again, if you have a major lift, then, you know, you always have a start position and a finish position of that lift. Well, it turns out those are the physiologic bookends of range. And so what's really nice is that we can work on an aspect of your range or an aspect of your tissue position, your positional quality today, based on what we were doing. So, hey, if I see that you're having a hard time getting down into a good deadlift setup position, yes, we know how to compensate. We can put you on blocks, we can, we can move to a trap bar, we can do all these other things, comma, Turns out you should be able to have normal hip function, which is at least 120 to 130 degrees of hip flexion. And if you don't, I know you're going to start reversing early in that setup. And what we need to be able to do a better job then is identifying in the context of our movement what compensation looks like. Because compensation is me working with incomplete mechanics while solving a problem. Because we'll continue to deadlift. You've seen people get into the worst positions possible in deadlift, and they don't get hurt. It's just really poor technique that doesn't allow us to handle larger and larger and larger weights. There's a reason, you know, that you start to see all of the best technique starts to really look similar as we approach the sort of the limits of, of capacity. And, and this is where it gets confusing for people because... Um, one of my uh, sort of a coach I really follow and like is a guy named Franz Bosch, who really uh, he uh, coaches a ton of rugby. He's international. Um, a couple books he's written, but one of this last book is called Anatomy of Agility, about sort of the motor learning, motor theory, about sprinting and mechanics and, and motor behavior learning. And what's interesting is he says, hey, there's more variation in waltzing than there is in sprinting. And the reason I really like that term is that we can't really talk about what is best or best physiologic range or best position or best technique until it's heavy, it's fast, it's high volume, right? And we're really starting to expose. And that's why, you know, look, man, if you're squatting a goblet, squat kettlebell, I mean, it, you can get away with murder. It doesn't really matter. But if you want to go fast and you want to apply that to other sports or you want to, um, I don't know, scale that up or you want to teach to the highest expression of the movement, we need to be able to identify what these patterns look like when someone is working around a problem. So I want you to always have choice in your training and you can absolutely turn your feet out when you squat, absolutely. But I want you to appreciate that that's gonna lose some of your hip function the more we turn out. You're not gonna be able to maintain that isometric and your knee potentially becomes a little bit more open in the bottom position to squat. And it's more difficult to have a more stable closed ankle. So if you turn that foot out and you, you have perfect technique or good technique that doesn't wobble, it doesn't leak force, fine. But let's appreciate that if you're going to run and jump and cut, having your feet turned out doesn't transfer very well. And suddenly we sort of have this pattern interference where we're trading one way, but we're trying to compete or move in another way. And again, what we're always saying is, if this is a choice, let's make it a choice. But if this is the only position you can get into to solve this movement problem, then that's incomplete. And, and, and squatting hip crease below the knee or parallel with your feet straight is a really low bar. That's what I want people to appreciate. Like that's not an ass to grass squat. That's not crazy range. That's you know, like, this is mid range squatting. That's why powerlifting is so awesome. It's all super mid rangey. Like we can powerlift forever. It's slow. We can handle large loads. We can, I mean, I just am such a fan of that movement, comma, it's real mid range. You know, there's not a lot of reason you see a lot of old Olympic lifters for, you know, for example. So yeah. th the bottom line is we need to be able to identify when people are working around a problem. And that means we need to be able to see when people are losing rotation, when they're losing stability, what the signatures of compensation are. So I'd love to get into um, what kind of the first lines of attack are there. So if you see somebody starting to lose the internal rotation of the hip, you see somebody starting to lose the external rotation of the shoulder, um, obviously, I just, just maybe walking through your thought process of maybe assessment and then and application of first order of business. Yeah, well, you know, let's, let's give it a framework. What I try to do is, is put this on sort of the systems approach. So, you know, the first and most clear one is movement. Like, does someone understand the technique? Do they need, just need cueing? You know, like, hey, break the bar, spread the bar. You know, I saw you warm up beautifully, and then as soon as it got a little heavy, you start flaring your elbow on the bench. Like, why did you change your technique? Is that what you do when you run? You start running fast, you start heel striking? No, I mean, we, like, your technique should be stable, 
under these conditions. In fact, my goal with the load is to be able to challenge the limits of your positional capacity. That's right. really the goal. Can you maintain this position under load, speed, cardiorespiratory demand, metabolic demand, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, you have a really stable, strong athlete. And what we see, unfortunately, is the more compensation you do, the stiffer you will become, and it begets more compensation. The more effective mover you are, the less maintenance and input it takes. I don't think people appreciate that if you just move better, right? And I'm not saying you can't make errors. I, in fact, if you're not making errors and wobble in your heaviest set, I'm like, well, it probably wasn't heavy enough or you're not really challenging yourself. But the idea here is that we are always trying to get people to move the most effectively we can. How do we know? Well, this is how we bench the most weight. There's not a big elbow flare in the bench at 1,000 pounds. It just doesn't look like that. They look like robots, right? Really simplified systems. So the first order of business is, well, can we cue you into a better position, right? Can we, can we give you the feeling? Because frankly, people are missing a lot of this movement language they can't feel. So watch someone squat, for example, and look at their foot pressure. It's all over the place, up on their ball, up on their heel, arches collapsed, turned out, they lift their big toe up. And I'm like, that was just in the one set of five we just did there. I saw all kinds of crazy stuff. And so people don't know what the interoception or interoception should be to like, hey, how do I maintain that full foot? How do I maintain that tripod, that feeling of pressing so that that squat translates to my deadlift, translates to my kettlebell swing, translates to, you know, heavy step up. So first and foremost, we have to make sure we're not making just a, a, a technique error. Right. And that's why we warm up and we do technique drills. And that's why, you know, the old the old West Side was like, man, you do 10 sets. 95 pounds before you were 65 pounds where you went up, right? You just, you just groove the pattern. Oh, that's practice again. But then, you know, we can then start to say, well, what are the aspects of this tissue system? So we, we think in kind of three big buckets. Is this a fascial problem, a myofascial release problem, a fascial stimulation problem, connective tissue problem? Is this a joint capsule problem? That joint capsule, like I'm a traditionally trained manual therapist, Australian manual therapist. That was where I came from. And they prioritize a lot of joint positioning, joint mechanics first. That's why I basically translated the Maitland approach into self-care with all the bands. So I was like, why do I need a physical therapist to do this to me when I can do it myself now that I have a band? So if you've ever put a band on your hip, Dick Herzl was doing some long distraction. And I was like, man, I can replicate my hip function mobilizations as a therapist, but you can do it yourself. That's why we started adding band and things. And then... We, last one is, hey, it's just muscular stiffness. Because people forget, like, yes, people get tight when they're weak and don't have control, but people just get stiff because they're strong. And look, if I see a you know, 95 pound yogi, she's likely not to be stiff. She's likely to be tight because she doesn't have the control or the, the mass, right? That's very different than my 600 pound, 700 pound, 800 pound squatters who have very, very stiff tissues. So that, that neuromuscular component is key. And then finally, we have to talk about environment, right? And that last component is sleep and hydration and nutrition and safety and tribe and downregulation and relaxation because I really can't see what's going on in the system if the environment is toxic to the organism. So, you know, first order of business is, hey, let me see you get into a good position. And if you can't cue you, then I'm going to stop you in ranges where you stop compensating. So we're still going to press overhead today, but you're going to press with a landmine. You're not going to strict press overhead, right? There's ways where I can still get the stimulus, but the key here is that I don't mire you into that position forever. Then I get to have the next conversation. Well, hey, you know, one of the things I want everyone who's listening to appreciate is that your range of motion is a living document. It's like a credit score that changes. And ultimately we should be rediscovering ourselves every day in the gym. Every day you bench, you're a different person than you were yesterday. Based on holding your baby, jumping on a red eye, doing your job, the crazy German volume training that someone talked you into, like whatever it is, you're a different person today. Injury history, like sensitivity, got into a fight with your partner, now you show up and your shoulder hurts, like it's just a different thing. So what we're trying to do is get much closer on, hey, I don't do a mobility assessment or screen once a year and put it in a drawer. 
I'm assessing my positions every day in the gym based on the movements that I'm doing. And again, it's harder to understand if you're just doing selectorized machines. It's harder to really appreciate that. That's why you're going to have to be under real low. But every bodybuilder I know can deadlift, squat, bench, press, like they do all the good stuff. So the key here then is, is to start to say, well, okay, what is the component that maybe maybe lacking what you see is that people are like i rolled it it didn't fix it i was like well maybe it wasn't a fascial problem maybe your joint capsule is super stiff right or your quads were super stiff so we have to be thinking in a systems approach and ultimately what i'm asking people to do is say hey let's let's take the gym or training session and also make it a diagnostic tool so that we don't have to run some parallel prehab rehab program busy work i want you to get warmed up work on your technique get under some heavy load and conditioning, do what you need to do, use as a diagnostic tool to improve your positions, and re kind of adjust your positional quality. And then maybe at home before you go to bed, let's do some down regulation. Let's jump on some soft tissue. I mean, if you, people have lost their minds, they're like, you know, rolling and self massage is bullshit. And I'm like, really? I'm pretty sure people have been touching other people for a billion years. And if I can get you to sleep faster, have less pain and change your fluid viscosity and, and desensitize a painful area and dress your muscle stiffness, I don't know. That seems pretty reasonable, except you don't have to wait every three weeks to, until you can afford a massage to do that. So if we can get these little micro doses where we're restoring position in the context of training, do a little soft tissue restoration, keeping an eye on range of motion, then all of a sudden this thing is really easy to manage and it doesn't feel so overwhelming. So it sounds like you're saying that, um, you know, there's three systems we need to address. And if you're, if you're assessing these things pre-training and you're seeing some limitations that maybe you should just stay within what you have available to you right now yes, and, let's and, train. And, and address the, the limitations afterwards. Yeah. And an easy way to do that is, you know, man, you know, you can, if you're doing a heavy lower body day, you can be working on your upper body in between the supersets. You can throw in some, like, I want your density to be higher. You know, a good example is, um, uh, uh, Anson Dorrance is the head soccer coach for UNC women. He basically created, you know, women's international soccer and the American program. And his program is 90 minutes long. So he makes Brandy Chastain and all of these crazy, phenomenal women, but his sessions are 90 minutes because that's how long the game is. But it's tightly scripted, and there is not a wasted breath in there. <laughs> Everything is intentional. And that's what, I mean, look, the gym is the, we've sucked a lot of joy out of the gym these days. There's like, it's so serious, you've got to hit this percentage and do this plan. And like the gym is the only safe place in the world where you can actually be politically agnostic. You can relate to everyone. You can basically fall on your face every single day and be humble there. It's the greatest place on earth. That's why we love the gym so much. In fact, I, I would argue maybe we spend a little bit too much time in the gym if we're athletes and we should be playing more and doing other things. But aside, the gym is, is rad. But in that 90 minutes or however long your session is, man, it needs to be dense. Like, you know, there's not sitting around on the gram waiting. In that three to five minutes between your heavy sets, there's something else you can do to be working on your position. And that means that it's not like I need a bunch of busy work, but I can do very focused around, again, restoring one position, one idea. There's no reason on a heavy bench day, upper body day, split, whatever you're thinking about this, you can't be noodling on your ankles in between sets or throwing a band on your hip or getting yourself prepped because you're always in front of the next session. You know, that's, that's you know, I think people really want the secret squirrel program where they're like, show me the mobilization and the activation and then the thing for the moment. And I'm like, dude, that's, that's, your body is way too sophisticated and complex for that. But I'll tell you that whatever you today, you're always ahead of the next training session. So if we open up your hips now, it's going to pay dividends on Friday. So let's be thinking a little bit more densely about that. And then also, re restoration of position is not a hobby. It's not a sport. It's, I mean, rolling your quads is not a good sport. So let's, let's stop being maniacs. Don't come into the gym and lay down. Come into the gym and start to get hot and sweaty and work on skills. Play, then identify a positional restriction or something you want to noodle on or doesn't feel right. 
Because that's the point. I'm under my squat today. I'm like, man, it doesn't feel good. I'm not pulling well today. What's going on? Right? Instead of just being like, well, I suck today. My back hurts. Like that's really great information about, hey, I wasn't able to hit this position as effectively. Let me go noodle on this position. Could you differentiate for me between flexibility and mobility? Because I think there's no, a lot. I have, of- no, I have no idea what, what flexibility well, is. Well, there's a lot of confusion there, right? And people yeah. throw those terms around like I'm going to stretch versus mobilize. And I just love to hear your uh, perspective. Well, you know, let's start with the idea of this, that um, first and foremost, if you don't see change, you didn't make change, right? And um, so if we're trying to mobilize or stretch, I'll put in quotation marks, so I'm not, I'm really not sure what that means in such a loaded term, right? Like, what are you, what's your goal? What are you moving towards? What's full? How do you know when you've done enough? Like, that's really what we haven't established for people. That's why we have clear benchmarks of start position, finish position. Here's the physiologic ranges. We call these archetypes. That's our language around this, right? That overhead is overhead, whether you're doing a handstand, a pull up, pressing overhead, downward dog, swimming, it's still overhead. Base all the principles of joint stability and rotation, doesn't matter what you're doing overhead. Um, when we work with athletes, and remember, one of the things that we've done is I created a model for understanding complex movement, right? We have to start, we start at the spine, but we see those as the biggest losses. We get into the best position we available to your spine. I don't think you're going to herniate and blow up if you lose that position. You're going to make mistakes, but you're tolerant enough to do that, right? But what we see is, man, if you're super flexed over, you can't breathe on your bike. You know, if you're cranked over in your pelvis, man, I guarantee you, you're, you know, you're not going to have this good overhead position or shoulder control. So we really want to make sure that we're, you know, beginning to sort of look at what's going on, moving our way out. And, you know, the, the heart of the, the flexibility idea is we see that athletes do what works and they reject what doesn't work. And so if you want to see how well your program is, give it to a bunch of people and see how sticky it is. Because if you make gains, people can integrate it into their system, into their language, into their culture and community. That's the goal of around anyone's system. You're trying to help people be better at their thing. I don't know, Ben, what the best ways to train bodybuilders are or, or physique athletes or strength athletes. That's not my expertise. But I can overlay my program punk, right into your language, and immediately you'll be able to pull and pick and, and improve the position and tissue quality of your athletes in the context of your athletes. So when we see people just jumping into stretching, I just see people doing a lot of things. I'm like, well, what are you assessing? How are you knowing if this made a change? So we have said, look, we don't use the word flexibility because we think it describes the properties of rubber hose. And, and it's an old word and we need to be careful. And let me just be clear, like I don't even use the word rehab. I try not to use it. I'm like, I'm training someone with an injury. Rehab is something to get you independent so you can get off the toilet in hospital. That's independent, that's rehab. Everyone I know either has an injury or a history of injury or something they're working around. They're not in rehab, they're fucking training. So, so the language we choose is, is key and, and Ultimately, when we look at stretching, well, what am I doing? Am I just pulling on your active tissues? Does that, do you think that's going to make a difference? If I don't have the key in the ignition, I can push the car all I want. It's never going to jumpstart. So let's appreciate that the more we can get your brain involved, the more you can own your breath, own your positions. We bake in, for example, a ton of isometric work into everything we do. So if you're laying on a ball, you find something stiff in your quadriceps and I like contract into the ball, right? That's a desensitization technique. That's also an isometric that we're doing in that position, which tells your brain, I own this. So I I don't just stretch and pull on you and then have to do a bunch of non-scientific exercises to get you you stable again. I'm getting you and restoring positions and mechanics all the time. And the other thing is that we're always mobilizing towards better, more stable shapes. We're not just pulling on the tissues, hoping that magically, if I just put enough tension on the system, it'll work. For example, let's look at your hamstrings. You know, I'm not a great deadlifter, but you know, if I can pull 600, I mean, I just pulled 550 a couple of days ago on my, on my fake knee. That's not great, but a little me bending over and touching my toes, you think that's going to change my hamstring at all? Are you serious? Like, there's no way that that's enough. So what we see is this notion of stretching really doesn't capture the system, right? Doesn't capture the fact that environment matters, that technique matters, that, you know, it, you know, you may be pulling on something, but never address your joint capsule. 
You know, you may be pulling on something and never mobilizing your fascia. You may be pulling on something and never addressing true intramuscular, intermuscular stiffness. So let's, let's use those tools and then let's scale the tools up and down. Let's figure out how to really change behavior. And in this situation, it's movement behavior. And then we can begin to noodle on giving the context of, hey, I see you can't put your arm over your head or you don't have any rotation or you can't extend your shoulder. Let's, let's improve that today and we'll get the rest of it tomorrow. Amazing. And you, you alluded to the fact that all movement, or you guys created this, this protocol that where all movement starts from the spine and works outwards. And you also incorporate the word breath. So I want you to kind of dive into how much you're actually looking at breathing mechanics mm. that applies to uh, human optimization and function. Well, I'll, let me just dovetail and sort of wrap up what you, the last thing is that we have a model that helps us try to understand what we're seeing. So that this is why I get to work in every professional sport, all, like so many Olympic sports, you know, every branch of the government, I, I get, I, all the universities, I get to go behind the scenes and see everyone's dirty laundry. And I really had to struggle early on to try to in, syn, synthesize and integrate what I was understanding. And so what we, what we try to do is like, here's our model. And then we try to break the model every day. So this is what the model predicts. And this key is that I want people to understand that if you're looking at any good model, it should explain current phenomenon, it should predict future phenomenon, and it should be easily communicated between us. Those are the hallmarks of every good model. This is why I can hand you an athlete and you understand immediately because we have a common language and you can hand me an athlete and we don't, right? Th that's really important. And a lot, of, a lot of stretching soft tissue models don't do any of those things. They're, they're completely agnostic about how the person is moving. So, and then I forgot what the heart of the second question was. Um where you see breathing mechanics oh, yeah. applying into performance? Well, breathing is the first movement of the spine. So let's let's just appreciate that if you're not paying attention to breathing, then you're really not understanding how the spine works. So the probably the best ex explanation is from Philip Beach, who wrote a book called Muscles and Meridians, and he looks at the trunk as a radial contractile field. And so if you appreciate that really the goal of a lot of the musculature of the trunk is to maintain the integrity of the neural tube, the spine, by squeezing and creating fluid pressures, right? That, so air is a, is a fluid, your guts are a fluid, right? The whole thing is about trying to be able to be appropriately stiff and stiff enough to maintain your positions and stiff enough to ventilate at the same time, depending on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm working with... Uh, you know, a good example is Wes Kitts. Wes Kitts is going to be our super heavyweight, goes to the Olympics. He's already qualified the spot. A few years ago, um, his coach, um, Dave, is a good friend. And Wes had uh, received a clean and jerk at uh, the Pan Am Games and blacked out. And that's not a great way to win the Pan Am Games, to, to receive a heavy jerk and then, or, you know, heavy clean and then pass out. And what we worked on with him was pressurizing before his jerks. And now he doesn't miss jerks. But you'll see he's become really good at pressurizing in these moments where he has received or he's doing a hang and you'll see that he'll pressurize. And if you look at his details around his pressurization, it's immaculate. And then he's now jumping on a gigantic, huge breath. So whether we're talking about our strength athletes, trying to create more intra-abdominal pressure and stability through the spine, or I'm working on the VO2 max of my elite cyclists, elite runners, elite swimmers, we look at the efficiency and the mechanics of the spine through the breathing as the first order of operation. And what I don't take for granted, and I do a ton of breathing drills just kind of buried into warm-ups and, you know, we do, we do jump roping. Um, I do Wim Hof style breathing um, every day myself. Uh, I'm always working on on restoring my ventilation because because I like to lift heavy and paddle and do these other things, my upper back is super stiff. And the, I found that the best way to mobilize that was actually to be able to breathe, not get on a foam roller and roll around, but get on a foam roller while breathing and making sure that I had the full excursion. So again, restoring the movement is the first order of operation always. But I'll also tell you that when we look at the breath, can you diaphragmatic breathe? Can you pressurize appropriately in the best position available to you? And suddenly we have this incredible diagnostic tool. Because if I ask you to put your arms over your head and your breathing changes, I'm like, hmm, that's an inefficient position. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to get to the bottom of the position of your squat and we're doing tempo squats, you're going to have to breathe at some point. And you know, I'm going to see how effective you are at managing this pressurization. What we see is that either athletes can pant 
or they can hold their breath. There's no in-between skill. And we're having to sort of reinvent that, right? And this is why, like, I'm like, you know why I believe in fives, heavy fives, or heavy eights? Because there's no place to hide your shitty breathing. <laughs> You're going to have to show me that you can pressurize in between. But we also look at breathing when people have low back pain. The first thing we do when we work with athletes with low back pain is reestablish breathing and big diaphragmatic breathing because we're able to decongest the spine through that pumping of the lymphatics. We're able to get non-threatening movement in. We're able to re reset CO2 tolerance. We're able to restore extensibility and pliability of the trunk. And, and all of a sudden, also, by the way, it doesn't hurt anymore, right? And then we're also getting someone scaled up. So when they're back under load, they can pressurize effectively. What type of frequency would you recommend um, someone looking to improve their breathing uh, efficacy? Would it be like a, a multiple times daily thing or uh, obviously depending on the scope of the, the um, limitation? Well, you know, what I want everyone to appreciate first is that I think in the morning, and in fact, if you go to the Ready State blog, the TRS blog, I have an article there called My Morning Routine. And there's a little hip flow, just a little simple end range. It's 10 minutes. Just get your hips open in the morning with your coffee. And the idea is when it's time to train later on, I don't want you to have to do a bunch of movement prep. Or it's time to go out on the pitch later on and you've gone from a meeting at the NFL with the receivers to, to the – you have to be playing football in 10 minutes. This is how the NFL works, for example. Or, hey, you really are compressed. I only have 45 minutes in the gym. I need to be able to get into the gym quickly and not have to do a lot of positional restoration. I want to be able to get into the gym and warm up. I don't want to get into the gym and be like, okay, now I'm going to replain, reclaim my hip range. So if we can get a little bit of work done in the beginning, what we see is that it's easier to then hit those positions later on. Like a credit card we're trying to crease. Where it needs more creases before it starts to get loosey-goosey, right? But first thing in the morning, one of the things I recognize is that when we look at real behavior change, which is so much of what we're trying to do as coaches, is change behavior around nutrition, sleep, integration, positive mindset, I mean, movement behavior, it's all behavior change, is that I look at where people have agency. So if you leave the house with a meal already made, you're going to eat that meal. If you leave the house without a meal, I guarantee you you're going to look around and grab whatever is easiest to grab. This is the, tr the way the world works. Mm -hmm. So if we can constrain the environment or look at when people have agency, it turns out in the morning, it's a perfect time to get yourself spun up. And so I love a little five to 10 minute breath practice in first thing in the morning, I'm just spun up and I'm like, oh my God. So that later on when I'm on my bike or I'm paddling or racing or competing, it's much easier to ventilate and hit those things. I've done sort of this, this base physiologic practice and I feel great because I'm stiff from, I'm 47 years old. I like to get under heavy loads relatively to my age and capacities. I'm not a strength athlete, but I also get stiff in the morning sometimes because you know I'm a 47 year old guy. I'm not a 20, 20 year old mutant anymore. So like I was ever a mutant. But the idea here then is suddenly that, that breath practice works itself into all of my sets because I'm working on pressurizing. And what we look at, if you were doing a heavy five by five back squat, for example, just as, a, as an example, a heavy five, I would look at your pressurizing in between sets or in between reps as the quality of your shape. Because if you're starting to fatigue and your positions are decaying and your last breath is tiny, I'm like, hey, that tells me a lot about the quality and stability of your training, right? That first rep should look like the fifth rep. In fact, the fifth rep should be better because you just did four reps in front of it were practiced. So you should be making fewer errors. So suddenly we can work this breathing, this pressurization into everything we're doing. And what we see then is it just becomes part of the language of better movement function. Talk to me about foot function, Kelly. I think, um, you know, with the yeah. footwear that exists, um, it seems in, in my practice anyways, that foot dysfunction seems to be the most common ailment that I run into with, with athletes. Yeah. So, you know, that in my eyes transfers up the, train, the chain, but I'd love to hear your perspective on um, what, one, um, how to approach it, two, how to diagnose it, and then maybe three, your perspective on how do you think it fits in the entire yeah. chain. What's really interesting is that if you, um, if you are a coach long enough, you'll come back around to two things. You'll obsess about people's feet and they're obsessed about their breathing. It's really, totally like right. it's totally like <laughs> you're going to be like, I know where you are in your coach development because you talk about people's feet all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, you've become a master. Congratulations, right? And then you really start looking at people's breathing obsessively and you're like, why am I obsessed with this? Because you see that those are such big sinks. Yeah. The problem with shoes is that it's hard to see what's going on, and it's hard for people to feel what's going on in those foot coffins. There's a reason that the homunculus <laughs> <feel> that. <laughs> foot coffin. I wish I wish it was mine, but uh, 
you know, um, what you'll see is that the brain maps a lot of real estate for hand and face, right? But it maps as much real estate for the foot as it does for the hand. And I don't think people realize that a lot of low back pain kind of related things can be improved if you improve the ability of the foot to sense and position and understand what's going on. Not only do we see better kinetics through the whole chain, we see better stiffness, better force production, better ground reaction, ground force reaction systems, the whole system yeah. when the foot works better, but we start to see upregulation in the rest of the system. You know, so like maybe decrease in, in low back pain. So the real question is not our feet important, but where do I work on foot position? Right. That's really the question. And I think what's interesting is that if you watch people squat and deadlift, watch their feet. And if their feet look like sloppy melted pancakes in the heavy sets, that's a problem. And what you're seeing is, well, it's not very sexy to work on your foot position, but your arch is a non weight bearing surface. So if your arch is smashed down to the ground because your foot is turned out and your ankles collapsed, I guarantee you, you're leaving performance on the table. And again, you, that may contribute to your Achilles tendinopathy. That may have, be an impingement. That may be less, more force through your lateral aspect of your knee. I don't really care. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. What I can tell you is that that's crappy technique, and that's technique that doesn't get the most out of your body. So one of the things that I obsess with, one of my um, favorite devices is this thing called um, the Slack Block. Slack Block, and it's made by our friends at Slackbow. And I don't have any financial relationship with the company. I'm just a fan is that I want a lot of this balance stuff, right, play. That just is in your kitchen while you're doing the dishes, right? And this, it's like a mini slack line in your house. But it's just, it's, you know, it's 14 inches long. It's super small. And you can just stand on it with the ball of your foot, Caldeet style. You can balance on it. You can work on breathing. You can do the Z Health head turns, vestibular work. You can track with your eyes. You can do pencil push-ups. And you can drink coffee or drink a beer while you're doing it, right? While you're watching the TV. And so for me, I'm like, hey, let's, let's make the environment more rich. Let's have feet be stronger, which means at home, I want you to be barefoot as much as possible. Obsess about your feet, right? And if it's possible in your training environment, do some barefoot training. What you'll see suddenly is, man, if we start to do things like jump rope every day, if we start to work on balance a little bit, we start to care about your foot function a little bit. We, we do some work where you're having to have stronger feet, then all of a sudden you'll see that the system will self-correct and upregulate. But we just need to make sure that it's buried into the process. And it's easy to let the shoe hide the dysfunction and people can't feel. So let me give you an example. I teach it over a local high school um, when that was possible. Um, there's, they have a great strength conditioning class. I use our book. And I go in once a year and I, I talk to all the sophomores in this program. And last time I was there, they were kind of obsessed with running. And I was like, great, everyone take your shoes off. And I made them do some just 27 squat drills. We're squat with the feet out, squat with the feet in, squat in tandem stance, feel your feet, da da da. Just pressure, pressure, pressure. So it doesn't matter what your foot orientation is, learning to jump with a full foot is really a key skill. Then I had them run around the gym, just some simple sort of tempo running where we kept the cadence at 94 so they had to be springy, tap into their fascial systems. And I was like, okay, kids, put your shoes back on. And the kids were like, whoa, it's pushing me over here. My arch has collapsed. I can't feel the ground. Whoa. And I was like squatting. They're like, it's like I'm on a mattress. And I was like, huh. So in 20 minutes, I take 100 kids and they all freak out because they put their shoes on and realize the shoe is driving a ton of weird sensory information upstream. So it's not an accident that I basically am infamous in my house. I, get, I love shoes. I take the insole out of my shoe. I run as flat as I can. The shoe that I'm currently obsessed with is the Nike Metcon because you can take the half inch piece of foam out and that thing becomes a minimalist slipper. Hmm. Like it's amazing how thin it is. People are like, it hurts my feet. And I'm like, you have salad feet. I'm sorry you have salad feet. Right. But um, what we really want to look at then is which shoe then gives me the best tool in the gym. And it turns out it's not the one that looks good with jeans. Yeah. Have you tried Vivos, Vivo Barefoot? Oh, fantastic. What a great yeah. company. Yeah, they're awesome. I so, have a pair of their hiking boots and I, I love them. And, and really, shout out to Vivo for making their shoes look less hippie. Like that's, you know, because, you know, my wife, I've had all the shoes and my, my wife calls them birth control shoes. She's totally. like, not, not those, but she's like, hey, you're never going to get lucky wearing those shoes. Let's say no partner. And I'm yeah, it looks like you're wearing a Kleenex box on your feet, right? Well, oh, like, oh, oh so sad. Yeah, Vivo, Vivo's doing a really good job. <laughs> the dream is like, you should be able to 
wear a great pair of shoes that doesn't mess with your feet and simultaneously get laid or go out to dinner with your family, you know, and not be embarrassed. Right. And, and what I want people to appreciate, there's a lot of shoe companies that solve that problem or agnostic, but the shoe that interferes with your foot the least is the game. And you need as much padding in the shoe as you can get away with. It's not an accident that like Chris Duffin's new shoe, it looks like a slipper. Or we use deadlifting socks. Like why is Andy Bolton in deadlifting socks? What's going on there, right? And what you're seeing is, hey, that foot function really matters. It mattered so much that our athletes started thinking differently about it. Yeah, and amazing. So much value there. So the only one area that I want to touch on and see how much you've, you've dove into it is eye function and how that's orienting the body in space. Is that something you look at? The Eric Cobb and the guys at Sea Health really were the people who um, who put that on my radar. And then one of my best friends is a woman named Rachel Balkovec, who is the uh, first woman strength and conditioning coach in Major League Baseball. Now is the first yeah, woman. Yeah, yeah. she's amazing. Coach. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah. So Ra Rachel, because she is obsessed, and if you've ever read David uh, Epstein's book, The Sports Gene, yeah. You, there's a lot of information about rod density, cone density, looking at – and there's a reason that Nike put a ton of money into getting people to track their eyes. And they, was, they were able to predict Cy Young Award winners and like hitters by how they could track by cone density in their eyes, right? And what I'll say is I think that we – if you went outside and rode a bike, mountain bike, or surfed or skated or played frisbee – you are probably getting a lot of this depth and change and you're having to orient and watch and use your full range through play. And then a lot of us suddenly are in Zoom and then we're in the gym. And I think what I want people to appreciate is that where are we going to restore your natural function around this? And for me, again, it turns out that during warm-ups is a great time to mess around with this. At home, balancing on my slack line or my slack block is a great place. You know, we keep a bongo board, which is, a, you know, a, a balance board. It's like a surfboard on a tube. We keep it in our garage, and my girls just love to go out there and play on it, right? It's not, it's not like, hey, now we're going to go work on balance kids. We gamify it. They play, and then I'm like, okay, now turn your head while you're doing that. And what you suddenly see is that if I can integrate those things into play or into warm-ups, you know, and, and it's easy, for example, like I love to do a lot of single leg pressing when I'm warming up for overhead which means I'll warm up my shoulders, press, and then during my warm-up sets, I just pick up one of my legs into like a high march position and do the eccentrics there. Or why that bar empty bars over my head? I just look around or change my head position. It's not really a lot of load, but during the warm-up, I integrate these things, and then I forget about it, right? I don't need to practice it. I mountain bike, I ski, I do these things. And what we're really trying to do is get more richness into the environment because I honestly, where are the places to put this? Um, I have the snap tech goggles, which block out, you know, they flash and they block out, um, you know, your visual perception. And then I throw the ball to my girls when they're wearing these snap tech goggles. And basically I really force them to upregulate their eye function. A ton of this, my daughter, Georgia has a convergence problem. She doesn't, can't really go super cross-eyed. So she just does pencil pushups during when she's born on zoom and pencil pushup is just tracking your, you know, your finger towards your eye until you lose it. And suddenly when it's just background noise and health, it's not one more thing I have to do. Or more importantly, I don't remove the big blocks of my training, right? The things that give me the big bang for the buck. One of our coaches says it best. He's like, look, I see a lot of people who build meals out of condiments, right? And what I want you to do is have those big macros and then you can spice up that any way that you like or that works for you. And I trust you that you'll know what works for you. What have you changed your mind on the most in, in the last five years? Um, you know, uh, I've, I've become a lot more reasonable. Um, I, uh, I think the environment is even more important than we like. There's some things I'm non-negotiable about now. Sleep, non-negotiable. Like if you're trying to get stronger, you're trying to change your body composition, you're in pain, and you don't get eight hours of sleep, I won't work with you. How's that? Because I'm like, I can't even tell what's going on. Your brain is too sensitized. That means you need to be in bed for nine hours to get eight hours of sleep. And that's really reasonable. I mean, you're trying to make some big change. You're a growing body. You're trying to put on mass and you're sleeping five hours a night watching Netflix. So I made people track it. The other thing I'm a big fan of, and you'll see the trend from Stan Efferding to Mark Bell, to, is I think we need, all need to walk a little bit more. Um, and not for any other reason than we need to accumulate more non-exercise activity so we can fall asleep. Because your training session was gnarly, but it's not enough non-exercise activity. And secondarily, I need to decongest you. 
And what's happening is we're basically on Zoom sitting, doing our thing. We go smash ourselves in the gym and we come back and we sit down again. And that's not how the system is supposed to work. We're supposed to be in more movement. I sit on the ground a lot more than I used to because I find out that if I just sit on the ground and work or sit on the ground and watch TV, I don't have to keep my hips as open because I'm always fidgeting on the ground. Um, as I've gotten older, my diet has gotten more and more important to me. I've realized that I can't wiggle out of that and that uh, I really like carbohydrate. How's that? I didn't realize like I, I love carbohydrates. So, uh, you know, those are the things I think have become more focused. And, um, you know, really I try to think about, well, where is this going to fit in? How do, how do I, I – I'd say the big thing is that, you know, 10 years ago um, – you know, when the gym was really becoming a thing, you know, really like boutique fitness, you know, I, I owned a gym for 15 years. Um, suddenly everyone's swinging kettlebells and you know, doing stuff and looking like they're really training. It's not just this Russian iron pit. Um, what I'll say is I think we lost our minds in the gym a little bit and that what are we training for is the question I want to ask. And if your question is, I want to look good naked. Great. That's an answer. We can do that. But if your question, if it is, I want to ski better, I want to play more, I want to play better soccer, I think one of the things that we've done is we've sort of fetishized the gym so much that we've fallen into the classic trap that we see a lot of, or we saw a lot of track athletes, track coaches make early on. It was easy to make gains on the bench. It's, it's harder to show quantitative changes in your throwing technique. And so what I'm trying to say is what's the minimum dose in the gym that we can get away with then so that you can maintain your play and your sport. And I think, don't get me wrong, if you can't do 10 pull-ups or you bench press your body weight or, you know I mean? There's some benchmarks there that we need to really focus on to get you up to speed. But then I'm like, okay, you're probably strong enough. We probably should work more on your technique or your sport and your thing. And also I saw that people were like, look, we know how to train athletes. CrossFit's a good example of this where you can do really freakish things, but you can't do that and actually play a sport at the same time. So, you know, we lost our minds around how do we actually prepare people for sports without blowing the energy demands, making them so fatigued, they can't actually do their sport. You know, my, my girls, a good example, I mean, they play water polo, and when we go lift, I have to keep in mind that I'm trying to make them better water polo players, not better lifters. Right. Um, you mentioned you're, you're in the process of writing a new book. Tell me about it. Well, you one of the things, you? oh yeah, yeah, for sure. We're, it's called Built to Move. And you know, one of the things that we have always said is, I love to work in high performance environments because it allows me to really understand what's essential, yeah. right? You wanna, if you don't work in high environments, you'll, see, you'll, you'll ask questions like, why do you believe that about nutrition or sleep? Because I'm like, because you can't perform this way at these high levels unless you do these benchmarks, these baselines. That's how we understand. So what we've done is we've essentially, ostensibly taken sort of our Formula One experience working with people across sports and platforms where they need to be their sharpest, baddest selves. And then we should be able to apply that backwards to the other aspects of society, the other stratas of society. Otherwise, sport is just circus. And what I think is we can actually transform society because of what we know about the body. Like look at all the nutritional, like the practicing nutrition. It didn't come out of dietitians. It came out of the sports performance body composition. Yeah. That's why we know what we know. Even, even this, this reduction in carbohydrate really came about the consciousness, paleo magazine, keto magazine. Where did that come from? From the dietitians? Mm -mm. It came from our strength and conditioning athletes, right? Yeah. And our coaches trying to change body composition. Um, so what we're trying to do with Built to Move is say, hey, look, we need to play a game of durability and we need to apply what we've learned in these high levels of sports and performance because you and I are talking in an echo chamber right now. Like we really, we might have different techniques or different styles or different outcomes, but you and I agree on 99.9% .9 of the things. And what we're seeing is I'm like, hey, this community can become more effective, but until we actually take what we're learning and apply it to the rest of society, this is what we call industrial fitness. This is, and the goal of industrial fitness is not to transform society, transform consciousness. It's to make money, right? So what, I think we can do a better job of taking what we've learned and then give it to people who are struggling to feel better, who don't exercise. I mean, you and I, the reason we exercise probably, I'll just speak for myself, is so that I'm not addicted to drugs and in jail. <laughs> I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I thankfully, I discovered exercise instead of, instead of cocaine. So, yeah. you know, what I want... 
people to appreciate is that not everyone has the same experience or drive that we do or the they haven't figured out how to cope or self-soothe with the ways that we have coped and self-soothe. And we have to begin to say, this is essential because if I have to give us a grade right now as a fitness industry, we get a D minus. And we get a D minus because we've signed our names, but highest obesity rates ever, highest diabetes rates ever, the most spinal surgeries, the most dysfunction. Women are tearing their ACLs at six to eight times the rate of men. Kids under 14 have seen a skyrocket of like over 400% in terms of ACL injuries. I'm like, choose something you give a crap about and then apply that backwards. And you're like, mm, I don't know if we're doing very good, but man, we have the strongest jackedest athletes we've ever had. Right. Yeah. So I, and that's, that's what we're working on. Built to move is our project around taking our, all the things we've learned from our friends and our experience and actually trying to help the person down the street. And that's so great to hear. Kelly, uh, man, huge fan. So grateful you can make it on the show. If you want to leave oh, a website, thank you so much, man. Yeah, if you want to leave a website for the audience to follow you or social media. We are at the ready state. And um, what I want to appreciate is a lot of, remember, everyone comes out of some kind of tradition, some kind of history. And so if you were lucky enough to run into you, you're probably going to be further off for ahead than, you know, someone who just kind of discovers lifting on the internet and is trying to go through the, the, you know, the Instagram memes about what to do. Right. And, um, what we appreciate is that, man, a lot of people don't even know how to take care of their bodies. They didn't even know it was a thing. Just smash, rinse, repeat, smash, rinse, repeat. And what we've done is through our site is we, we do have a two week free membership and we'll teach you how to mobilize and the fun foundations of some simple care. And that's all you need to do. If you're sophisticated enough to program bench for yourself and squat splits and all that stuff, guarantee you're sophisticated enough to restore your position, make yourself feel better. Yeah, I think so we're just trying we're trying to put position back into the context of training. I think the challenge is, you know, people think it has to be hard. They think it has to be this really complex workout program. And like foundationally, it's just simple. You know, the three things I say everyone needs to do every day is breathe, walk, and meditate, right? If you do oh. those three things, you're so much further ahead of everybody else. And so I build that into everyone's program as well. And if, if they can start with that, now you start to give people, you know, confidence and momentum and mobility to be able to start stacking things on top of that. And I think hopefully we can convey that message to the world and just like, it doesn't have to be complex, right? No, no, no. Which, how many macros do I have? Like, well, I, I need to know that, right? What right. splits do I do? And you know what? I, and it is, I think that's just human nature to chase the fun, shiny thing, right? It feels special. Right. And you're like, this other thing seems too simple to work very well. And what we see is that because people aren't doing it, they don't do the basics. It's really hard for us to understand what's going on. And ultimately, what we're trying to do, I think, in strength and conditioning is take complex movement phenomena and simplify it as much as we can. That's why I want your deadlift to have the same start every single time because it's so hard and the weights are so changing. I'm trying to unify your technique. Well, the same thing is true in your behavior. It's really difficult for me to understand that chronic elbow pain if you don't breathe, if you don't walk, if you don't drink water, if you don't sleep. Yeah. I'm like, you know, there's just too much noise there. So that's the foundation for a body. And then I just want to leave people with this notion that you're going to be 100 years old. My grandmother just passed away yesterday. Oh, she was 97, wow. right? Think about how much she'd seen at age 97, passed away in her sleep, survived COVID, got the COVID. Uh -huh. And if that's the case where, you know, I have another auntie in my family who's 100 years old, and I'm living and facing two women who are almost 100, and if you're 30 and your back hurts all the time and you're – Man, you got 70 more years on this carcass. And what I think is we can still play this really short, excellent game where in our 20s and 30s we can just burn it down. But you have to start thinking about this long game. And, man, I don't want you to fall and break your hip when you're 70 because your ankle function was so stiff because you're powerless from your 20s. Not necessary. And so what really is – what you'll see is our, even our focus a little bit less on fat and a little bit more on muscle mass – that makes you way more resilient as you get older. I mean, I really am like, how conditioned do you need to be? You're, you could do Peloton twice a week. You're conditioned enough. But man, let's put some hamstrings and glutes on you, right? Because because <laughs> your immune system, your ability to be independent, your ability to take a hit. You know, I just saw a statistic that 50% of the kids, uh, like fourth graders who are alive today, are going to be 104. Wow. So just think about that. Now think about nutrition choices, sleep choices, environmental choices that we're making. And we're like, hey – it's difficult for us all to conceive of this long game, but this is the body you've got until you die. So let's make some different decisions about it. And by the way, the, that sh long game we're playing is how you win the short game. This is yeah. not sexy. Kelly Sturat, you're amazing, man. So grateful for your time and your wisdom.
Thanks, man. Appreciate you, man. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. Thank you so much for tuning into the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm always doing my best to search the world to bring you the best guests possible to solve all of your health and wellness problems. This, this conversation goes everywhere from muscle to mindset to environment to stress to just giving us the tools we all need to thrive in this challenging world. And you can, right? I want you to all know that you absolutely can thrive in this challenging world and you should. And oftentimes it's just as simple as making a decision to flip your brain, surrounding yourself with people who think differently and ultimately empower yourself in every decision you make. And every decision we make, there's an opportunity to step into empowerment and step into our power or step into a victim attitude. And I think um, we all should become conscious or we all have the ability to become conscious of making those decisions. So I hope you do. And something cool to look forward to, there's gonna be a muscle intelligence community um, beginning really, really soon, a private community where we're all gonna support each other on all of these goals. And I'll tell you guys more about that in weeks to come. And I'm really, really excited for this private community. Um, and we're gonna, I'll give you more details as the podcast progresses. But today's podcast is brought to you by Real Mushrooms the best mushrooms on the planet. I literally, you guys know that I intentionally search out the best ingredients for myself. And this is how I come across these products, right? This is why I use Belkempo meats. This is why I use fresh press olive oil. This is why I use real mushrooms. This is why I use masszymes um, because I intentionally see, see, uh, seek out the best quality ingredients because for me, it's just like when I train, right? It's not about quantity, it's about quality, right? Training should be quality before quantity. Food should be quality before quantity, right? I want the best quality stuff. That stuff literally becomes my tissues. It becomes my cells. I'm like, why would I want to put crap into my body? I don't understand. So all these other things that are not organic and isolated grains, I don't put grains in my body. It's pro-inflammatory. So head over to realmushrooms.com and use the code BEN for 30% off. 30, yes, which is amazing. Uh, if you're a first-time customer and they are going to hook you up, even if you're not a first-time customer, they're going to give you 20% off. So booyah, head over to realmushrooms.com slash Ben. And thank you for being a listener of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, for always being loyal. Uh, I am grateful. I am so grateful you listen. And uh, thank you for leaving me a review. And please share this with at least one person you know and love who wants to live their greatest life in the body that they Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.